Hi, everyone. So nice to see all of you here today and those of you joining virtually. My name's Elena Sundrogano, and I'm the National Project Manager for ENACT. So I was with the ACT Network as well, so happy to be back and be back in front of all of you. So ENACT is the next phase of ACT, evolved to Next Gen ACT. So please bear with us as we work through our interim branding here and rebranding, although Jeff slides later on, we might steal your uh, interim branding logo. I think that uh, that works out quite well. So you're gonna hear from, uh, predominantly from Sham today and then Jeff and Michelle a little bit later, but we're gonna talk about an act and what your involvement's going to look like. So timing of this conference was great for us since an act was officially official just a month ago. So thanks to Diane for holding space on the agenda for us. Um, so it's really nice to be able to introduce the work that an act plans on doing over the next couple of years uh, at this symposium. So you'll hear from Sham around what, um, what it's going to look like over the next couple of years and some of the aspirations for the program. Jeff and Michelle will talk about data quality. So I know you've heard some of that already just between yesterday and today, but uh, it's really a priority for us, not over the life of the program, but starting out sooner rather than later, which is really exciting. And then there was going to be a discussion portion, but we actually have more content to share with you than we were anticipating. So we're gonna move the discussion offline and host a webinar in the coming weeks so that we can devote more time to these discussion questions and hear from all of you. So before we get into an act and what to expect with the program, I wanna remind everyone what the ACT Network built over the past I think it was in total seven years from its very, very beginning. So the network includes almost the entire CTSA consortium, which was contributing over 142 million patient records for cohort exploration. So that was quite a lift that everyone undertook uh, over the past couple of years. ACT also built or helped build an enhanced shrine and user interface, an image that you'll see here. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, a methodology for EHR data harmonization, which includes the ontology that very quickly adapted uh, at the onset of the pandemic. Um, and it's now, of course, as we've heard multiple times, used locally at many sites and also through various other national networks such as 4CE and N3, N3C. The ACT Network also introduced weekly smoke tests and visibility into data characterization that I think has been really helpful for sites to see what's going on across the network. And then in turn for folks using the network to also have a little bit more visibility into what they can expect to see at each node. And last, but certainly one of the most important components is the community that the network built. So even just through the mailing list that we have, something as simple as that, we've seen throughout our various upgrades, community support for each other and ultimately everyone helping each other to support the goals of the program. And this is one component that we don't want to lose and we want to build upon with an act. So we really want your involvement, your participation, your insight as we seek to, uh, to meet all of the aims of an act. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Sean. Thank you, Elena. <clears throat> Uh, so as Lena mentioned, um, we are transi transitioning from ACT to ENACT. And really the key point to note is that what ACT did was build this core discovery tool, um, a real-time tool. And uh, the transition now is to transition it into a research, a full-fledged research network. And uh, so the goal for ENACT is essentially to enable transitional researchers, like who are trying to grapple with EHR data to do re research, to be able to do it um, in some seamless fashion across um, the entire country. And uh, we have probably about 40% of the country's population's EHR data uh, accessible through ACT. And that's a big number. And so being able to um, do that, to do research and discovery research um, is what ENACT is uh, going to try and do. 
So it's going to be a five-year uh, funded project. Uh, we just started up um, a month ago. So just to briefly describe uh, what ACT was and what ENACT is going to be, is, uh, it's the largest collaborative EHR research environment, uh, currently at 142 million patient records and growing, uh, has a real-time query tool. What we want to build further uh, is a platform for um, statistical and machine learning, as well as a learning uh, informatics system. We also want to make things simpler and easier, uh, which we have already been doing in ACT in terms of upgrading ontologies and upgrading uh, software. So uh, for ontology, for example, uh, we want to be able to make the installation much more simpler. Um, we also are working on making the ontology compatible with the other data models, uh, including OMOP and eventually PicoNet. Um, and convert essentially the entire network into a tool for conducting large-scale research. Uh, we also have this ambitious goal that uh, we want to use ENACT not only for just discovery research, uh, but also to enable clinical decision support at the point of care where clinicians can, answer, can ask questions which might be answerable through EHR data through like a patient's like mind approach. So this basically uh, lays out the aims, um, which are pretty ambitious. Uh, so aim one is to essentially turn this network into a collaborative research environment. And currently, as you know, uh, we have Shrine as the main query tool, and it will remain, and it will get upgraded. Uh, but we also want to introduce other tools like Leaf, which you have seen. Uh, ShareFee is a tool uh, which is going to enable essentially sharing of uh, queries so that once a query is constructed at one place, you can share it through this uh, library in the cloud. Um, and then a data quality dashboard, which um, Jeff uh, is going to talk about. Uh, aim two uh, is the heavy lift, which is to turn it into a statistical and machine learning uh, research network. And we want to be able to do both uh, federated analytics across the network, as well as introduce central analytic enclaves. And I'll talk a little bit um, about examples of how we want to do this. Uh, and then in the out years, uh, we want to leverage this network to enable um, clinicians to generate evidence uh, using this patients like mine approach to improve patient care and then eventually convert this into a learning informatics system and uh, design dissemination and sustainability for that. So what we can do through Shrine and what we have been doing so far in ACT is cohort exploration, which is preparation to research kind of queries. And through Shrine, we can go forward and do some level of research queries. So here are some examples, uh, which kind of give you a flavor of what we can do with just what we call simple counts. Uh, so for example, you can do prevalence and incidence of diseases. Uh, and here's an example that was actually done in Pitt, I think a few years ago, where an investigator wanted to know what's the prevalence of cyclical vomiting. And all this required was really two counts, uh, the number of individuals were coded with cyclical vomiting and the total number of individuals in the network. And they actually got an abstract out with about half a day's of work. Uh, and then you can go on to uh, using, like say four counts, uh, which measure associations and relative risk between say exposures and outcomes. So for example, if you want to know whether the uh, patients with COVID have higher risk of stroke, uh, all you really need is four counts. Uh, you need a count which is individuals who have COVID and who developed stroke, and then individuals who had COVID and did not develop stroke, and then individuals who didn't have COVID and developed stroke, and individuals who didn't have COVID and did not develop stroke. And with these, you can compute these kind of crude 
uh, associations and relative risks. And then you can do more complicated things, like um, you can look at uh, existing medications which are used for a particular disease, like say RTX, which is used for B-cell lymphoma, and see whether it's effective for something else, like rheumatoid arthritis. And this was something which was explored by um, the team in San Diego. <clears throat> so that is kind of uh, examples of uh, research queries that you can do through the front end, which is the Shrine interface. Now, you can also do more complex um, research queries through um, what I call the 4C approach, which is the federated approach, where you essentially have code which is written to work against the data model in I2B2. And since it's standardized to the ontology, uh, code which is written um, for one I2B2 should be runnable on multiple I2B2s across various sites. So these, uh, this kind of uh, code can then be used for doing more complex things like, say, characterizing acute kidney injury in hospitalized COVID patients. And this, is, this was uh, one of the projects which was done in the 4CE network. And here the approach is you have an analytic team that develops scripts, analytic scripts, um, and participating sites execute these scripts on their I2B2s, and they essentially transfer results, which are basically counts and statistics, to the analytic team. And then the analytic team puts this together to do appropriate uh, meta-analysis. And then eventually, you can go all the way up to um, like the N3C approach, which is essentially you bring in line-level data into an enclave, and you can do more sophisticated analysis. So one of the goals in NACT is to enable um, these enclaves on a study-specific basis. So a study gets designed, and uh, sites which are interested in participating, uh, you would have line-level data, which is appropriate for that cohort, uh, moved into an enclave. And then um, the analysis gets done, and then the data uh, gets uh, destroyed. So this is kind of the spectrum of research that we envision we can do on this really large um, national network all the way from kind of just using counts through the interface, which you can do in real time, um, to federated analysis to more central um, analysis. So that's just to give you a flavor of uh, where we want to go um, with this uh, network. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elena. Okay, so year one, let's stop thinking about some of the lofty goals of an act and let's focus on what we're going to be doing in year one and our ask of all of you who are continuing to participate in the network. We're just asking that you maintain your node. So come up to current network standards for Shrine, I2B2, the ontology. There's going to be an upgrade or two in this first year uh, once that's evaluated by the network ops team and refresh your data regularly, so monthly at this point in time. As Sean had mentioned, we're really anticipating that this left is going, lift is going to be significantly less than what it was to initially stand up your node to participate in the network. I think with every upgrade or update of I2B2, Shrine, the ontology, it's becoming easier and easier. Um, Michelle, Sean, I know we have an ontology version coming up soon. Do you wanna talk a little bit about <laughs> but what what's different about this one as far as making it easier to install? But it will be easier to install. <laughs> so we're really hoping that um, it's going to require a lot less time on your end. I know it varies everywhere, but it should be a lot less time for you to come up to network standards and continue to participate. You'll hear more from Jeff on the data quality component. So we're asking that you run these data quality scripts locally, submit back to us centrally, and uh, we'll be able to help you see things in your data with these scripts and add them to a dashboard that will be uh, visible. And participate as much as you are willing and interested in 
working group. So of course, data harmonization, which a lot of you already participate in. If you don't, but you're interested, please reach out to me. We meet monthly at this point and are always looking for folks to continue to participate. Uh, the data quality component, dissemination and communication. So we didn't really do this a ton with ACT, but we're looking to with ENACT. So if it's something that you're interested in, if you work directly with investigators at your institution and you have some comments, feedback on the best way to help share value or what we can do to make things easier for your local end users to understand the value behind um, leveraging a network such as this one, please participate. More information will be shared, of course, across our mailing list and the newsletter once we kick those off again. And then the other item that's not on here, but we do have our test network that's separate from our production network. I think we have eight or nine of you participating, but the test network receives our ITV2, Shrine, and Ontology versions before we roll them out to the production network. And it's an opportunity if you participate in the test network to see these versions first, to comment on the documentation and help us identify the best way to roll it out more broadly to the production network. So our test network has really caught a lot of things that's made our rollouts to productions go a lot more smoothly. So if it's something that you're interested in and you're not currently participating in the test network, let me know and we can uh, give you instructions on how to do that so that you can see these versions first before the rest of the network does. Any questions before we move on to data quality? All right, so Jeff and Michelle. <laughs> hey, everybody. I know most of you, uh, if you don't know me, I'm Jeff Klon. I'm uh, ass assistant professor at Mass General Brigham, and um, <clears throat> I do a lot of ITV2 stuff. I noticed this presentation it seems to be on like auto advance, so I would like to change that because it'll be difficult for me to talk at the speed I practiced at. Do you know how to do that, Mark? Is it just auto advancing or no? Yeah, it was auto advancing. That there's a setup show on the Mac version, but I don't use the Windows version. I too really like this. Huh. Setup slideshow. Here we go. Manual. Hey, there we go. Yeah, cool. And then probably here. If I click here, it'll go to that slide. Okay, great. Great. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. That okay. just was a bit of a lag there. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Back to the back to the talk. Um, this may be a, a question that I might get mocked for, but I don't know who from out here is all involved in ACT or ENACT, so by show of hands, if you're somehow involved in the ACT network, the ENACT network, okay, all right, so 70% or so, great, okay, so I know who I'm talking to now. Um, I, so a lot of the things we're doing with this data quality are, are equally applicable to the ITV2 core platform as well, but um, ENACT is gonna be a major consumer of this and and uh, or, uh, the rollout will go to this so I guess I guess Elena liked this uh, my tweak to the act logo um, but uh, it's supposed to indicate that maybe the enact network will look a lot like the act network and uh, Sean already talked about this and many people know this it's all all the sites are connected through shrines so you can query in real time and get information like cyclical vomiting um, the key to all this is uh, the ontology that um, Michelle and others have put a lot of time into. And sites put a ton of time into mapping their local codes into the standard ontology codes. And uh, just a shout out to all of the sites who've done such an amazing job with this. And that allows us to have this harmonized ontology that we can query quickly. 
However, uh, there could still be problems with data quality, and that hence the the emphasis in this first year of an act on improving our data quality. There could be um, systematic missingness. There could be chunks of data that are missing, uh, perhaps because it was never recorded in the AHR, and that's that's challenging to fix as a, as a research network. But there could be problems with the ETL process. I remember I was involved in another network, and at one point a site refreshed their data, all the procedures disappeared. And because we had some, some checks running, we could see that suddenly patients had no procedures. And that is an easy thing to fix. It's, it's something that happened in the ETL script because the source data format changed. And, uh, but it's an important thing to be able to flag so that you can notice this, because otherwise you won't notice it until you're doing uh, research on a particular procedure and not seeing codes. There can also be mapping problems. There could be things that are mismapped. There could be things that are in the local data that are not mapped to something in the ACT ontology, so data that you're just not seeing. Um, and there could be coding differences across sites. So those aren't errors, but there are uh, blank codes for, uh, for various labs that are you know, very, very much essentially the same thing. You can, you can see up there, uh, I have ALT. There are, th there are three loint codes here for ALT. There is ALT in serum or plasma. There's ALT in serum or plasma with vitamin B6 or P5P, almost the same thing, or, or ALT without that. So the first one could have either, I think, and then the, the other two are, are just slight modifications of, of, uh, of the lab. And what I saw when I looked at this in the ACT network is that some sites had all of one or all of another. There wasn't really a mix. It was just a, a choice that different hospitals were making. So having some way to account for that is important. And through the ontology, there, all these line codes are in a folder for ALT. And when you drag that over, you, you, know, you get all the ALTs. And so that, that is what you want. So yay, yeah, yeah, ontology. But if you're doing analytics, you might need to be particularly cognizant of that. So another thing we want to do with the data quality is to be able to characterize how things are mapped at sites um, and just characterize the distribution of populations and diseases as well. Uh, this, is a, this is a slide from another presentation, but just I just wanted to highlight that data quality is not something that you know, ACT is behind on and everyone else is doing great with. Data quality is the challenge for everyone. This is a 2020 article from Jamia and the, the thing I highlighted is that the practice of data quality assessment is still limited in scope. There's not consistent assessment. There's heterogeneous nature of data. It's, it's a very difficult challenge. So in this year, we're going to try to make some headway. Um, and, we, and we did previously do a pilot that uh, Elena mentioned. Uh, we, so we have this functionality in I2B2. It's been there for a long time where you can store a count we call it a total num, but you can call it a patient count. Um, so for every item in the ontology, you can associate a count, and that count can be the number of patients with that condition. So here the, the small circled thing there is um, uh, the number of patients in this fake data set that have angi angiotensin II inhibitors in their record. And so this is a very rough way of kind of seeing where data density is. And you can drill down into like the NDC codes and see where the NDC codes are as well. And uh, so, so, so just this concept of counting patients is, is a very powerful way to see. It won't tell you what local data you have that's not in the ontology, but it'll tell you what's in your ontology, where your data is, how your codes are mapped. So you can get a lot of leverage out of, out of just doing this. So th this uh, counting thing is going to be the the core of what we're going to do in an act. Um, there, there's also a lot of other things you can do with data quality. And I wanted to highlight, um, this is some work Michelle did. Uh, to You can use the breakdown tools uh, in I2B2 and kind of in not, a, not a dissimilar way to how Mike is doing it with his data export to create these, these breakdowns that actually give you data quality measures. And these are more specific things like the number of patients with a visit, number of patients with date, dates that are in the future, so ETL problem, number of patients with you know, multiple conditions, things like that. And in her, in her example, th those can be pre-computed, stored in the database, and then queried through the I2B2 interface. And a lot of what we're thinking about is pre-computing this kind of thing, pre-computing the patient counts, 
pre-computing anything additional that we, we decided we want to, uh, to measure and then store that in I2B2 and get at it um, both at your local site so you can understand your data and centrally. Uh, so basically this shadows what Elena was showing are, are two bullet points for data quality are to automatically co collect uh, data from sites on data quality and then provide a central way and individual site way for, uh, for researchers and administrators to look at it. Um, uh, so again, the, the data quality first, <laughs> first pass is going to be counting everything in the ontology, counting the number of patients. These scripts to do this um, exist. They've existed in some form for many years, but in 1.7.13 of I2B2, we have a version that should be pretty robust and should run in the minimum amount of time you can run um, like 700,000 count queries on your billion row data set. So it takes some time, but it, it's been optimized as much as we could do. Uh, so, so those scripts are available. We're hoping that those scripts won't need a whole lot of additional development, but we, we could use some, uh, you know, some heavy testing on that. I think Postgres in particular hasn't gotten that much production level testing. Uh, we've tested it, but not, you know, not at, in real world cases. Um, and then the sites will, in addition to keeping their own counts, will contribute these counts to an aggregated repository. We need to find a way to do that so it's private to act, but you know, and can be submitted securely, but then can be shared among ACT sites. And the counts that you'll submit won't be exact counts. They'll be obfuscated. So it'll just be like submitting 700,000 shrine queries um, to a central place, a central place that not everyone can get to, of course, a central place that ACT people can get to. And then we'll have some kind of uh, anal analytics browsing to, to understand the data. Um, I, if we have time for a discussion, we can talk about whether we want interactive dashboards or want reports that are PDFs. Th there are a number of ways we can go about this. Um, so we'll, we'll get the patient counts, we'll collect the counts, and this was, this was the pilot that we did. And uh, I think it's, I, I can't count on the fly, but like 10 or 11 sites submitted uh, data, uh, mostly, oh yeah, uh, hello. Uh, mostly in 2021, but we got some, some new ones this year. The thing that we learned from doing this pilot is that administrators at sites are busy and they don't, you know, doing another thing is just cognitively challenging because you have a hundred other things you need to be doing. So uh, going into your, your SQL management studio and, and running the script and then remembering that you ran it the next day when it's finished and exporting a CSV file is just a little bit of a, a little bit too much of a lift. Um, so we really want to find ways to make this more streamlined, more automated, in um, it, probably in the next release of I two B two. We talking to Griffin about there are at least in SQL Server, maybe in other database platforms, you can create just scheduled jobs in the database that would be able to run this for you. Um, Maybe it's something that we can do through stored procedures that are run by uh, the Java code um, that then maybe we could manage the parameters for that through an I2B2 plugin using Nick's new plugin interface. And um, yeah, this is just a mock-up I created, but the idea might be that you can you know, set up various parameters, you can schedule the scripts to run on some regular basis um, at, you know, the third Sunday at 2 a.m. or something like that. Um, yes? Yeah, well, you, you don't want them to run more frequently than you refresh your data because then you're just wasting CPU cycles. Um, so we haven't set a frequency for an act, um, but it it certainly won't be more frequently than you're refreshing your data. So whatever data refresh frequency we end up using for the network, it'll, it'll co the idea is it'll coincide with that. So when you refresh your data, you just run all these data quality scripts. Now, if you're refreshing your data nightly, I don't, I don't know that 
you know, you, you need to run data quality every night, but we, we can we can work on that. You do a daily refresh, so I don't I don't think we'll be we be expecting daily data quality updates. I think I think uh, less frequently than that would be reasonable. Um, okay, I'll I'll keep diving into it, but you you all, you can all feel free to interrupt me with questions. Um, Uh, yeah, so uh, oh, also, yeah, another piece of this is we want to make the CSV simpler. I mean, exporting a CSV file manually from your database, everybody, at my experience doing this in the, the Arch network is that everybody creates their CSV file a little bit differently. The columns are in slightly different orders and the, the field lengths are different and some are char character fields, some are, um, you know, with quotations around them, some don't have quotes. Is, so we're going to standardize that, and I'm hoping we can rely on the Open CSV Java library that Mike's using for uh, for his data export stuff. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I'm going to keep going, but interrupt me if you have questions about that. There's certainly a lot of room to brainstorm about how we're going to do that. Um, we could also collect other things, like I was saying, patients with at least one visit, patients with multiple conditions. These are the kinds of things that. I mean, Michelle has some queries to run. We've also been doing this through a separate loyalty cohort project. We're looking for patients who utilize the healthcare system frequently. So we, we kind of know how to do these things with the ACT ontology. So we could incorporate some of those into the data quality scripts. I don't, I don't think that'll be the first iteration of this, but it shouldn't be too difficult if there are particular data quality things that people would like to see. Um, yeah, so another question we need to answer is, do we want interactive dashboard or do we want PDF reports or some combination there in, in between? Uh, we definitely, types of things that we want to make visible. We want to show what's missing. Like if a lot of, a lot of sites have um, patients with, with uh, type 2 diabetes diagnosis codes and your site doesn't have any, then that, that would be something important to flag. Might not be an error in your data, but something you should think about. Um, outliers, if you have, uh, you know, if most sites have 25% uh, of their patients have a diagnosis code, but you have 75% of patients with a diagnosis code, it's probably good, but maybe there's, maybe, maybe it highlights an issue in your data. So we want to highlight that. We also want to show mapping differences, which I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, another thing that we can do is if we aggregate all this data, we can look at network-wide averages, so to kind of characterize the whole population and look at, uh, you know, the average number of patients across the country through, with all the ACT sites that have various conditions, uh, which is kind of a, a neat use case. We, our, our goal with the pilot was to do that and then publish a paper on it. The paper hasn't actually happened, but it's still a goal to write the paper. So as we collect data for an ACT, we can think about whether sites want to participate in that, that external facing component. Um, uh, I've also been doing a little bit of uh, analysis on how we use the ontology and what, what sites are using. I'm just at the very front end of that, but I think that's pretty interesting and maybe more from a whole network perspective. Um, you can also, as you, as you run these scripts that count your patients and you run them at some frequency, monthly or something, then, um, the data is stored in this running total num report table in the database. So you can look at your trends over time. And uh, I wish I'd put the little graph on here that illustrates this. But you want, you'd want your data to kind of generally increase over time. Like number of patients with the diagnosis code should uh, not go down. Because if it goes down, then you lost some data. Um, so that's an easy way to look at uh, ETL trends. And I know some sites like um, our friends in Kentucky have, have some processes that automatically generate a report that looks for uh, trends in ETL that might indicate a problem, but we'll, we'll have you know, the ability to do that in a standard way with uh, the, the data quality scripts. Um, and we can add other metrics as well. So my hope is that this is not just gonna be a thing we have to do to check off a box for ACT, an act, but something that'll be really useful to sites to just have some quick ways of uh, 
of looking at overall characteristics of their data. Um, so on the dashboard side, this is a dashboard that I wrote in two weeks in Dash, which is a uh, Python framework for certs. It kind of merges the client and server, makes it very easy to create interactive dashboards. But this is not, so it's fun to demo this, but it's not robust. Um, if we're if we're really going to do an interactive dashboard for an act, we probably should do something as an ITB2 plugin and add add an API to the server. So if we if we really want to do this, we need to um, think about that and then spend the time on it. Um, the, I also really don't like the. I, I, you can browse the ontology here, but you can see it's just. Well, let me go to the next slide. It's just like a list of things, and you click on them, and then you hit the arrow down there, and it goes to the next level deeper in the ontology. It was the easiest way to hack it in the Dash system, but you need a tree view, really, if we're going to do this. Um, so those are some of the challenges ahead. But you can, you know, in this case, you can see you can browse. Uh, the site names are not on here for you know privacy, but you can you can see the, the variation of number of patients with the diagnosis codes at, at these sites. Uh, here you can see the uh, percentage of patients with the laboratory tests. So maybe a, a more useful apples to apples than number of patients. And there's, there's quite a variance there. Um, when, when we're thinking about creating site-specific reports, things that we've worked on already, we have um, we have an out at the t from top to bottom. We have an outlier report that shows you uh, where you have a percentage of patients with this fact that is different to a significant degree. Um, I don't remember what the significance was, like 30% different or something. Then, um, then the average in the site. So the the uh, the green line is this particular site. And the uh, purple or pink or whatever that is is the network average. So you, know, you can see that um, you know, like the site has fewer about half the people have a record of aspirin than in the network, which you know, knowing aspirin is not a prescription drug, and so these things don't always get recorded, especially in an outpatient setting. You wouldn't know if someone's on aspirin, so unless it's added to the med list and yeah, you know, the consult. But uh, so, th so that might indicate a data quality problem. It might just highlight something about how data is collected at your site. And so it can be kind of interesting. Um, and then uh, yeah, the CPT code is definitely a flag. Like this site has 10% of patients or so, no, sorry, 15, 17% of patients with the CPT code. But um, on average in the network, 60 some percent of patients have a CPT code. My, my wild guess, what would happen, what would cause this is you're not mapping the codes for visits, uh, the, the codes that are used for billing just to, to uh, indicate that there was some kind of visit, which you know, it boosts the number up quite a bit. And then we have missingness reports. Um, and we've had some conversations about how to display this better. Uh, what this is trying to indicate is that this site has no ICD-10 procedures, but the average in the network is, is not that high, but it's around 10%. Uh, so you might want to go track down your ICD-10 procedures. So we can, we can um, go back and, and enhance these and focus on these as well. Uh, and this is network averages, so you can, this is a high level, so you can look at various domains and see what's, what's in the network. Um, something that I did a little more recently. This is focused just on like four different labs, but you can see um, the different sites have mapped different things. So the, the height of the bar is the number of sites that use this particular code, and the clusters of the bar are lab tests. So on the left, you see like ALT, and there are three codes, and two of them are used more frequently than the third, or maybe more dramatically, bilirubin, that one particular one code is used at all the sites, and then uh, these other two bilirubin codes are only used at half and less than half of the sites. Um, so my thinking about how to do this kind of mapping differences is to focus on particular things like laboratory tests. Um, one of the challenges in doing this I've found is that there's just so much data. I mean, it's a lot smaller than like your ITB2 data set, but there's 
you know, 700,000 ish, no, at least 300,000 say, counts per site times 50 sites, if we get data from everyone, um, times a couple of refreshes if, you, if we're doing it on a frequent basis. So finding a way to visualize this is, in an effective way that conveys the most information is um, another thing that I'd love to have feedback on. Uh, so the ontology, if I counted right, is about 700,000 entries. Uh, of the, there's a, there's a star down there that kind of got clobbered, but it says just, just at participating sites, so among these 10 or 11 sites, um, only using about half of the ontology. Uh, everything else is, is just in there that can be used, but no one, no one of these 10 sites are using it. Um, interestingly, there is this 267,000 are codes that are used by more than one site. And that means that there are, what, like 60,000 codes that are only used at one particular site. So uh, one site might, ha might use a particular code for, um, for anemia that nobody else is using for some reason. And these, kind of outli these are all kind of outlier codes for that reason. The, not the 267,000, but the, the difference. And, and looking at what those specifically are can be kind of interesting. Um, so, so the data quality becomes more powerful, I think, when you're collecting information from a whole network and you can compare yourself to the network. Uh, the difference here, the, the chunk that's not used, is uh, this is just very high level. I haven't analyzed it in any great detail. Um, it's a lot of, oh, I didn't, I didn't actually look up what is, what is this UMLS C0031437? That's COVID. That's like, it's COVID codes. Hmm. So, yeah, I think it is a high level. It's a high level of the COVID tree. Oh, okay. So all that's saying, I guess there's there are a lot of COVID codes that people aren't using. No. Um, and, and you know, and then social determinants of health is kind of a new thing. So that that's not being used. What? Yeah, uh, yeah, and it probably is. I don't know how many concepts are in there, but yeah, 22 seems about right. What? Oh, version, yeah. <laughs> that, I don't know what's going on there. Someone is using a version of their ACT ontology that doesn't have the version concept, I guess. Took out the hidden ones or something, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, that's the ones that, yeah, that's the, 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 the red line is pointing to uh, the, the area that, of the codes that aren't being used. But a lot of procedures, yeah, which I imagine are CPT codes that are old, but I haven't looked. Uh, the, oh, yeah, so... So if you think about this, this 267,000 that are used by more than one site, it's also interesting, I think, to look at the distribution. So there's, there are 70,000 codes that are used by exactly one site, which was, you know, you could figure out from the last picture. But then, you know, there, there are another 50,000 that are used by only two sites. And then, then there's this drop um, until you get back to like six, six plus sites, and then there's a chunk that everybody's using, or mo almost everybody's using. So it's interesting, there's, like, there's a separation between the one-off codes that one site's using and the, the chunk that almost everyone's using. The, the tiny one at the end, in case you're curious, is uh, demographics and visit information. I think that was a problem in data collection where um, not everyone not everyone's demographics ended up in our data set, but we'll fix that for an act. Uh, this is an example of what you can see across refreshes. So like I was saying, you want your data to increase over time and not decrease. Everything else that I had to talk about, though I only have four minutes left, are these discussion questions. Like, do, how, do we, how do we make this more automated for people? Do we focus on an interactive dashboard? What reports do you want to see? Um, do you, uh, do you want like a giant Excel spreadsheet? That's probably not a very secure way to distribute this, or are there interesting ways to visualize it that 
you can um, you can think about. Uh, so I'm going to open it up for questions. Though I should show this acknowledgement slide, and the the list of people involved in this will grow, of course. But uh, well, thanks for listening, and please ask questions because I'd like to figure out how to do this best. No? No one? Kind of tired? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, th this woman in the front first. Final reports, right? That have the shrine term uh, entry in there, entries in there, right? Not diocese. Yeah. So, it, uh, I th I think the question is about um, if you use local codes and then you use the shrine system to map them to ACT standard codes, then what are what is in your total numps, your table, and what do you submit? To share and yeah, the, the, there is a there is a problem we haven't solved there. Where if you use the Shrine Adapter Mappings file to get from your local codes to your um, to the ACT codes, then that is not read by the counting scripts because those are only you know touching the database, and and so then then it ends up just counting local counts, and it's, it, there is no current way to merge those with the rest of the site. Um, if you know if if you're using the act ontology, I think even just in the concept dimension, then it'll it'll pull in those and translate those to the standard paths. Um, did did that hit your question at all? I, yeah, yeah. No, I was I, I was wondering whether there is a solution out there to you know to, to generate those reports without um, you know using the act ontology. Run the counts on those in I2D2. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I suppose there, there is a bridge that doesn't exist. Yeah, well, uh, these, these scripts all started with uh, a SQL Server version that, that I think Griffin and Lori had written that was intended just to count your local ontology and put those counts in, because it actually is used in the I2V2 engine to optimize the queries as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly you can. You can use it currently to count your local things. The and then you can, but that's not going to be able to be part of a centralized dashboard because there's no way to, you know, compare across sites. But absolutely, you can use it that way. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I think Keith had a question in the back. So. <laughs> Do you think it'll be something that'll be integrated into Shrine and I2B2? Yeah, can we integrate it into Shrine and I2B2? I think that would be great if we could. You think integrating it? I, I think that, that would be the way to do it for like lasting impact beyond just this project. Okay. Um, I mean, it's easier to write it as a separate web app, but right. I think, yeah, if, if, it, if it proves not in, too difficult, then I think we should. Because probably we could add like one API call to I2B2 to get information out of the counts table and then uh, do the, then we can do the graph graphs instead of in Python we could do them in JavaScript um, yeah 
hasn't done any of the admin aspect of it. So I'm wondering if that's something that we should do. Because we can incorporate the dashboard and the admin uh -huh. as one. And then Griffin can have the, it's, it's doing new UI, which is the front end that the customer sees. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if this, if the dashboard, uh, if, if it's like only your site, then the dashboard maybe could be used by researchers too. I mean, in RPDR, you can look at the history of a, of a term, right? And like see how. Yeah, I mean, Facebook did a while ago. Yeah, we so did. Well, maybe it's something that could be used. Yeah. We did that old, like, kind of, we, did, we added some code that kind of was doing some stuff for Facebook. Oh, yeah, that's right. Kind of like showed how many queries are run that week and um, how many uh, observations are they have. So, and it had like, it was using like uh, React, I think. So we, it, could, it could be that that could be the dashboard. It, was that a separate, it was a separate React tool or was that a React plugin in I2B2? No, no, it was a separate thing. Separate thing, yeah. yeah. I think we were just kind of finding code somewhere. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's going to come down to how much time we have to put into this, but, but maybe we can leverage that. Yeah, it'd be cool. Mine's might be not so much of a question, but a comment, and, and that the um, the being able to compare your individual site against the the general statistics is is usually valuable. So, I I would want to make sure that it, that's one of the things you're looking at providing to be able to give us a sanity check for our own data quality, because sometimes we find codes missing, and to be able to see that everyone else has that code, that that's that's a great carrot to make sure that people do these data quality checks. Cool. Was that a question? It was a comment. Okay. Yeah. Being able to compare our our site, like it's great being able to see my own individual site. It's very valuable. Okay. Okay. Cool. I'm glad. Yeah. Glad to hear that. Um, you can also use the mic over there too. I just commented. These are some great topics for our user interface working group. So I'm going to try to get you to. Um, join some of those monthly meetings and we can walk through some of this. I'm both interested in the, the admin view as well as what we can put in front of uh, in front of the users. I think at a minimum in these interfaces like the ACT interface, I'd love to see each concept we investigate is to be able to see the total count as well as the number of sites that have that count. Mm -hmm. so the difference between you know, here's some code it says a million patients is that a million patients at one site and they're completely different than the rest of it, or is it uh, a smaller number of patients, but every site has those. And it tells you something completely different about the prevalence and the um, data quality. So um, let's, uh, let's discuss some of these things in that working group. Yeah, all right. Thanks for giving me a platform to keep this discussion going. Mm. Well, I want to summarize that again. I will sing it. No, no, do we use the information that we learn from these total numbers to start shrinking some of these ontologies as well? Are you saying? I know, I know we're like minimizing the view for the I would love to have a whole discussion about just yeah. this at our year meeting about, you know, is it useful to have the empty terms just them navigate through it, or do they want to work collapsing it in? Um, I've created a, on a separate program, we've created a visualization called SumTree that um, allows you to have um, visualizations of the depth of your trees, so 
might be able to do something to incorporate it in. Mm. But there's a lot, a lot more work that we can look mm. at on this. And some of it might end up in sort of act as these sort of interdisciplinary uh, challenges in dealing with ontology with a million branches to it and making it user friendly and um, navigable to research. Maybe there's an opportunity here for like work group crossover. Yeah. Oh, that's what I do. Synergy, there should be a word like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 hard to, um, it's hard to make UI improvements to the ontology without working with the yeah. data that's in the ontology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? There's a mic here, or I can come running at you. <laughs> Either one. This is like some, you know, really interesting stuff. So um, uh, I can see that there's some good fodder for future conversations in some of the work groups. All right, to be continued. Thanks.